Hey, we're live. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Bid and Ask by Dr. Wealth. Today, I have with me uh, Jeff Ong, who is a private banker. Uh, of course, we cannot disclose which bank he's from, uh, but he's here to share more about uh, private banking as a career and also uh, some investment ideas and things like this. All right. And uh, maybe we'll let Jeff talk a little bit about how he get into uh, private banking. Maybe share a little bit of your career history with us. Yeah. Hi, Elvin. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so how I started in uh, private banking was that um, actually that was one of my first uh, job experience. I was in one of the international banks um, a, as an investment counsellor. So that was about 20 years ago. Uh, in actual fact, investment counsellor is quite a new job role about 20 years ago, and then it's more like a dealer taking orders on uh, equity link note structures and bonds. And then we just happen to give a little bit of advice. Um, I went uh, quite a roundabout route. So I went into uh, sell site research in stockbroking for a good three years. And I think between then and you, during that period, I was SARS. And you know what happened in SARS if you are, you are old enough to know that uh, every almost everything went kaput. So um, uh, a lot of stockbroking firms started to merge and they don't want to they don't want the research team, so they just want the sales team. So during that time, I, I learned a lot in, in, in sell side research to, to do discounted cash flow and all that. But I decided that the best thing is to go back to banking. So um, of course, I did not, unfortunately, or fortunately, I didn't choose private banking because I thought that I wanted something very intellectual. So the, and I went to corporate banking, there was lending to institutions. I covered real estate and technology between old, old, old 04 to 07 tech and uh, real estate. So I learned a lot in corporate banking. Uh, at least I went back to banking. And uh, I think banks have, a, uh, in those times, were still the heydays. La. I mean, they have a lot of earnings from deposits, uh, uh, insurance, a lot of products that they do. So Corporate banking is where I really cut my teeth and learn a lot because when we are lending money, I think you're extra careful. And if you don't like who you lend to, you can write an internal report and say, suggest to cut lines. And I think uh, that's really, I'm really thankful for my stint there. At, okay, so from there, corporate banking is actually quite a sunset industry. Uh, you know, so at that time, I think. After a while, what I wanted to do was to go back to wealth management advisory and, and, and serve the high net worth clients instead of lending money to them. So I think 08, I made the move to go to back to wealth management. I, I started, I went back to investment counseling. So I, I was giving advice to the relationship managers for a good uh, seven years and uh, I enjoyed it. I climbed the corporate ladder, became a team lead uh, for a couple of years. Then I decided that, hey, um, I wanted to be in the front line because I wanted to get to know the wealthy clients firsthand. And uh, it is very inspiring to know how the rich became richer, how they became successful. And it's really a breath of fresh air. So I decided that in 2013, I wanted to step on to become an RM. So uh, that was how I, I, I am where I am today. So uh, I did not parachute down to private bank from an investment counsellor, unfortunately. I actually had to go through a stopgap measure where I was in a premier reserve type of role where the net worth was $1.5 and above Sing dollars. And I did three years in that role uh, as an RM before I went into a full-fledged uh, private banking where the requirements for the asset under management is a lot higher. It's like uh, uh, probably close to 5 million sink just to get in. Yeah. Okay. So is that like a typical route of passage for even a private banker, anyone? So you need to start off with someone, serving someone with, uh, uh, you know, that kind of premier reserve kind of levels. Or anyone can just jump inside being a private banker. Okay, there are many routes uh, to, to being a private banker. Uh, if you are listeners, if you are in your 20s, 
hear this uh, because a lot of NUS, NTU students, uh, SMU students are asking me how to get in. Okay, you don't really need a finance background. It is preferable. If you have CFA, that sets you apart, CAIA. Um, but I think if you sign up for courses on how to invest, that makes you uh, stand apart as well. So you can sign up for Dr. Wealth, you know, learn how to invest on the uh, value investing way. Um, okay, so from there, the career path will be some of the increasingly, I'm seeing a lot of people do the investment counselling route. So that means they cut their teeth as a junior investment counsellor, so like someone that uh, uh, understudy the rest. So you can come into the bank as a management trainee, and then three years you go around different different routes, and you decided that hey, I want to be investment counsellor. So they won't let you give advice in a real private banking setup for a start. Like you got to like make coffee and for someone or just joking. I think literally you do like You have to understudy a uh, someone that is very senior. Uh, 10 years of experience as investment counselor, and then you learn for the next three years what it means to give advice on the various products and then how to read the markets, how to invest. And by the time you hit 30, you can become a full-fledged investment counselor. So you, you can be uh, IC for about five, six years, and in your mid-30s, you could make that uh, transition to RM. The second route is through uh, retail banking. So you can cut your teeth in doing sales in branches. Uh, it is a very, very tough job. Uh. So please be kind to the relationship managers in the, in the branch. They have to make a living. Of course, they are now governed by a lot of uh, code of ethics as well. So uh, at that level, they have to get new clients at a branch, uh, uh, try to retain those clients with a high high net worth. From there, they need to read. Like, I mean, whoever walks in the branch with a, open a new account with four five 500000 through your job, where you stay, and all these things, they know whether you are you are high net worth. So you cut your teeth from retail banking to priority. Priority is 200000 300000 and above. And then uh, by the time, again, by the time you are 30 to 35, you will have moved up the privileged reserve route, which is usually 1 mil to 1.5 mil and above. And then finally, when you have enough large clients, right, then you move to private bank. Uh, that is, you have enough clients as uh, four, 4 to 5 million and above. Lah. So you really need to get that uh, uh, mess in the number of wealthy clients in before you can make it in private bank. Because in private banking, they don't really give you clients. By then, when you go to PB, you're expected to have your own clients. Uh. Yeah, it's not like a walk-in. You don't have a walk-in every day that says, hey, I've got 10 million to give you. Not, not going to happen. Okay, yeah. so, so you're, saying, you're saying there are many routes, but definitely you need to work, work your way up there, right? You cannot just suddenly your first job is being a private banker, serving people with more than 5 million. Uh, yeah. yeah, true. Okay. <laughs> There's another route that I forgot, sorry. Uh, I noticed that there are people, there are graduates that are that uh, became my uh, manage, what do you call that, management associate, mm. and then they are posted to become assistants to the RM, and then they are doing a lot of uh, admin work. Uh. So they they close trades, they make voice logs, uh, they you know uh, practically everything that the RM doesn't have time to do. Then you you have to pick up the pieces. Uh, dividends, corporate action, call the clients. So they could spend three to four years in that role. And one day when the RM is, uh, has left the bank or he needs, he needs to, you know, grow, groom some people and then they will choose the, the assistant, right? the assistant choose. So, and, and that could be one of the best route because the assistant already knows the client very mm -hmm. well. So normally the, 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 Senior private banker will might be a bit older, in the 50s, 60s, and then you say, okay, I, I want to cut out some smaller clients to you. Maybe they are five to ten million uh, asset under, under management to to that to that assistant. So if you if you follow the right RM, wow, well, I mean that then that's a great route to go. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, okay. So there are many routes. If uh, some of you are listening and interested in private banking career, uh, Jeff has just given you some ideas how you can work your way up. And uh, Jeff, you mentioned that you wanted to be at the front line. You want to uh, interact with all these uh, the clients, right? Who can build up their wealth. Um, do you? Can you share uh, how do most of these high net worth make their wealth? Okay. Hang on, I just wrote something to you. I need to refresh my memory. It's about seven plus now. So my brain needs to be refreshed. Okay, hang on. Right. Yeah, I recall uh, you, you mentioned that most of them are business owners, right? Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, most, I think 80% of when you talk about net worth of 10 mil and above, right? Most 80% of them are. are business owners. So uh, they can be listed business owner of private companies. Uh, those over 50 years of age are usually in the old economies. So they can be property developers, uh, traders, you know, commodity traders, however. I think the younger ones are up and coming and I'm beginning to see a lot of young multimillionaires. Okay, they are in the tech space. And uh, they can be, you know, I mean, no names mentioned, of course, but they could have listed their tech company and become one of the top uh, performers in NASDAQ and they could have opened a, a PB account. So, so increasingly, there are such people. Uh, okay, 20% uh, will be like the C-suites. Uh, uh, they are either doctors, CEOs and all that. In terms of education, right, I think um, the older generation... Not all of them are graduates. So education doesn't really matter like, at, at their age. I mean, I, I don't know about this generation, but the younger ones generally are graduates, but they are not the Ivy League first class honor style of people. So just be average academically inclined. That's all. I think you you can do very well. Yeah. Okay. So um, if education is not like a good uh, marker for, for being a high net worth, right? And... Uh, Interacting with all these high net worth people, do you find any consistent traits? Mm, are they yeah. like really risk takers or yeah. are they like very driven people? I, I'm yeah. not sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is something that I really enjoy doing. Okay. Dealing with the high net worth. They always have a can do attitude. It is it is huge difference in attitude in life uh, compared to them and i'm not saying that if you're employee if you if you want to be employed that's fine okay but the attitude of the the high net worth people are very can do they never say that oh i can't you know uh this is this can't be done that can't be done uh we only need to do this i think they they build they are builders no they actually build businesses and they think about possibilities just like you and you are you are an entrepreneur as well so uh, they don't, they may not function very well in a very structured environment where they only do certain things. They are exceptionally creative. And uh, one thing I can tell you that sets them apart uh, a lot from the rest uh, is that they really can smell opportunity. They can smell opportunity, okay? When the wind blows, it's just like a, a, a dog that can whiff out <laughs> where the criminal or a pair of socks, where it goes to. I mean, these guys can sense what it is and they are very flexible to, to switch from one type of business to another type of business. Um, and some of them are just lucky. La. They pick on that, that, that sector, be it uh, whether you're in the uh, real estate development where at a time when Singapore is booming or, late, or could be industrial real estate or data center and then you're at the right time. Or somebody happens to be a doctor and then have instead of uh, specializing on on being a surgeon they actually started a company and say okay a, a amalgamation of 10 doctors and under that wing and start a new brand and then go listing i think i think a lot of them just know how to build on a business smell the opportunity and build it yeah hmm. okay so you mentioned a few things right can do spirit yeah. uh creative and most importantly can smell opportunities yeah 
So um, I, I don't know where, where does this skill come from, right? Is it like uh, inborn or they develop over the years or is it just their character, like, like what you say, they are just not so academically inclined, right? So some of this probably brain resource that went into this uh, ability to smell opportunity, right? Yeah, so that, that's interesting, right? Um, I, I don't know whether is it too private if uh, there is like... Uh, a particular story that is more inspiring like how uh someone that you know uh managed to do some extraordinary things and achieve that kind of success yeah don't need to name names uh, if yeah. it's not sensitive okay. <laughs> you can just roughly I, tell a story about it that most uh, inspired you i think there are many many people that most inspired me the most it, the the most inspiring ones are you know wealth one thing a uh, wealth makes accentuates your character and mm. if you are a nice person wealth actually makes you just as nice and if you are not so nice wealth exaggerates oh, it okay. okay you become very demanding right so uh i always tell my friends uh, if i ever hit not that I'm very, I'm not rich, but if I ever hit a hundred million and I behave like quite nastily, please kick me. And they say, okay, I'll remember, I'll kick you definitely many times. So um, there, what inspired me a lot is those uh, rags to riches story. Um, and they, a lot of my clients are just O levels. Some of them are bartenders. They could be in UK, they could be living in Europe, uh, working their way up. Uh, first job doing sales and then after that became a bartender and then learn how to talk to customers uh, analyze what they want and then serve them uh, a lot of them have very good eqs and they could be today worth 40 50 mil and yet they are still just as nice and patient and then when you talk to them they are very reasonable they are usually in their 40s 50s 60s and uh, they they are still they very grounded people so, um, of course, their lives are not smooth and, and pursuing their passion uh, has cost to them. I mean, their time could be taken away from their family and all that. Okay. But I think very inspiring are those that manage to keep their family intact. And despite their working schedule and their success, it hasn't gone to their head. Their friends from 40 years are still their friends today. When I go to that birthday celebration, the same group of relatives and friends are there. And they never uh, quarrel openly, at least, la, about money and, and whatsoever. So I think these are the ones that uh, inspire. I have clients that actually uh, donated anonymously a couple of hundred thousands during this COVID. Okay? It is very common in Western country, but... Unfortunately, I don't see a lot in Asia, la, in Singapore at least. I, or maybe I haven't seen, but I've, I've personally uh, uh, experienced experience it. So much so that even my, my own, um, those, the government grants that was given to me, a couple of hundred bucks, I, I felt so guilty. I don't deserve it because I have a job. I'm blessed, so I gave it away as well. I think these people contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to, to a cause. I think these are, are great traits uh, to have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I like the point that you mentioned that uh, wealth doesn't change a person. It just uh, amplifies who you really are, right? Yeah. yeah. Because a, a lot of people will tend to have the perception that, oh, you know, if you are rich, you will change a totally different person, right? You'll forget your friends. You'll forget uh, who helped you along the way. But what you shared is that there are a lot of all these high net worth actually have friends over 40 years. Uh, family yep. are still, uh, very much intact and, and together. So uh, it's totally very different from what most people think uh, wealthy people are nasty, right? So uh, I think it's a, it's a good uh, kind of a perception shift. All right, for, for a lot of people okay mm. and um uh i i uh when you talk about when when um we will meet this uh, uh so-called high network people right uh mm. what or maybe i should rephrase the question what is the perk of being a wealth banker or a, or a private banker right, because people will think that um, you know you get to yeah. socialize with this uh super high networks right uh, yeah. Do, do they help you in one way or another? Yeah, okay. 
help me. I think today the job scope of a wealth banker, a private banker, is a lot, a lot tougher than 15, 20 years ago. There's a lot of admin work. Uh, why am I in the office today at 7.30? It's not just to wait for Elvin. Uh. I was doing tons of admin work for the last six hours. Uh, it's nothing to do with wealth management or, or business. So the, it, it's getting tougher uh, because of compliance, because MAS regulations and all that. Uh, banks are getting stricter in, in the requirements. Um, so the perks remain huge. Uh, and what's inspiring getting to know the, uh, the wealthy clients is that if they, if they trust you, um, they actually share with you their success story. By virtue of opening their, their private bank account, you have to write a report on how they became wealthy. And you need to get corroborative evidence. For example, things like uh, audited financials if they're owners of a company. And then how they started, when they started, you actually do a fair bit of uh, investigative report to ensure that the client is uh, uh, compliant, uh, not, not someone that comes from a place where he, he shouldn't be opening account because the money doesn't belong to him. So that alone, uh, the opening account portion is already like a storybook and you really know what they did okay and along the way you know even more you know, like uh, i mean there's a lot of wealth to a person if you if you declare everything the person can have 100 companies and 1000 properties if you declare everyone you cannot finish writing a book it's 1000 page so sometimes you do have to like uh, if it's just opening 10 million dollars of uh, aum then you just need to uh, uh, talk about that that part, the core part of the wealth that, that, that is being generated. So along the way, you start to know even more about the difficulties of the client, the challenges that you face, and also the, the, the family of the client. Uh, what is the family dynamics? Um, whether everything is in a smooth, uh, harmonious, or there are any health issues. Uh, sometimes they even may have children facing difficulties because the first gen uh, wealth created in Chinese, you say the first generation created the wealth, right? second generation yeah. maintained, third generation spend it, right? Spend it but yeah. I can tell you sometimes second generation cannot keep it. Now. <laughs> I mean, no disrespect, like, they may not because if you are, you are, you are, you are you're born with a silver spoon, right? I mean, you, have, you, you somehow will find out that your parents are rich. Will you have the same drive as your parents you may not you may not and then you have a problem so what do you do you put it in a trust and then give give them a stipend every month i i don't know so you of course as a child you try to emulate what your parents do there's a lot of pressure you may not have the aptitude to do it so after all after seven eight years in private banking i realized the importance of legacy continuity how to even at you don't have to be a millionaire you need to think about how what happens if you take a plane and then plane goes down uh are you prepared for your children to take over everything what happens to your stock account stock trading account does your wife know what to do with the stocks if she doesn't know and what if it's us stocks there's inheritance tax uh interactive broker who's gonna log in if it's not a joint account or what was still what if you and your partner pass away and then how young are your children all these things need to be thought of uh so uh yeah it, it has opened a lot of uh windows to to you know widen my eyes a lot yeah. okay so which means uh, um the through doing the job that's the the perk of really understanding all these uh, nuances of the the wealthy right and what yeah. to do and what not to do okay uh, you you mentioned about right um, the pri private banking job is harder compared to 20 years ago right so what are some of the main challenges that are being faced by private bankers nowadays besides paperwork and all the you know all the compliance issues um i think margins are contrary i don't know why what most people think in private banking the margins are the thinnest and the quality i feel that the quality of advice is probably one of the best uh and the margin are the thinnest 
okay and quality okay why the quality is the is probably the best by the time you reach private banking you're already in your the minimally 30 plus you're no longer a sweet young thing or something you know like 20 something just out of fresh out of school trying to give some financial advice the investment counselors will also be in their 40s some of them will be in their 50s so they have seen a lot of ups and downs so they know what how to advise you in a better way okay there's no guarantee of course uh, but also the margins have uh, 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 actually oh, I can I can say that it's it's like uh, from the year I started till now I already see margin compressions of 20 point 20 to 30 percent okay so contrary to what a lot of people think right uh, in priority banking maybe the margins are a bit thicker one two percent three percent but in private banking the margins on average is wafer thin okay you're talking about um you can check the bank's uh, uh annual reports um probably one percent return on on gross level not net uh, gross without deducting wages and uh, on your assets that's all they earn one percent the spreads are wafer thin and after all the deduction of salaries, it may not be that that profitable of businesses. That's why I say it is not really sunset, but it's actually a stabilizing business. I think eventually will will reach a, a sunset industry. It will be restructured in some way. So these are the main challenges besides uh, compliance, uh, a lot of admin work, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, duty of care when you open an account. I mean, maybe years ago, um, when you sign something, you open an account, it could take about a month to open or maybe even two weeks to three weeks, maybe, I, I, I think maybe 20 years ago. But um, today, it could take as much as six months to open to verify if, if it's a company account, who are the ultimate beneficiaries, a lot of reports and due diligence to make sure that the, the money that is in should be in. Yeah, bona fide uh, wealthy people. So... All these are, are, are compliance costs that take away the margins of the business. So, uh, and also there is there is a duty of care of giving advice. So, I I, I know uh, Elvin runs a, a education business, right? So, you can call it education. It's okay, right? So ultimately, whether the clients believe you or the followers, whether they, they buy a stock, they can't come back to you say, because you're giving advice. Uh, education for us we are giving advice so advisory is is tough because there are a lot of uh, once you're licensed to be an advisor there are a lot of restrictions and and duty of care that's required so uh, such as the research have, have has the bank done due diligence on it are you allowed to sell with a due a backing is it a buy call from the bank or at least a whole and then you're allowed to 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 recommend that product um, the risk profile of the client, for example, if he's a medium risk client and the product is a high risk, are you allowed to recommend because it's two notches above the risk? So all these things you have to take note. And if you if you venture or maneuver wrongly, even though the client may want it, okay, I want this uh, private equity fund or I want this hedge fund or I want to buy this stock, even though the, the their risk profile is only medium or growth you have to get a lot of compliance approvals otherwise uh, it, it, there's a lot of uh, um, it will affect your scorecard eventually mm -hmm. so so we are we are very compliance focused nowadays mm. okay yeah. okay so that Not makes all, all these things <laughs> make things tougher right do more work uh, and earn less at the end of the day <laughs> okay <laughs> uh Okay, um, we are about halfway of this interview. If you guys who are listening in, you have any question for Jeff, just uh, feel free to type in. We'll find time to address them later. All right? Okay. Um, so maybe I ask another question, um, uh, which probably a lot of people want to know, right? Uh, you know, there's always this saying that the rich get richer. And uh, do you think this is true? Do you think that the high net worths have more... Uh, ability to grow their wealth than the men on the street yeah this is my concern this has been my concern since the covid i mean for a long time this we, we all know the gini coefficient is very wide right yeah so 
in Singapore alone is very wide, Hong Kong also, and, and all over the world, the Gini coefficient is widening. Now, um, with money printing, right, what, what's happening is that the stock market is rising. You know, this COVID, the stock market just fell 36% in March 23rd. Then Federal Reserve said, hey, we'll print money and then whatever it takes. And then Europe started to follow and then Singapore as well, all the countries. So practically, the financial markets were supported by all this money printing and for a good reason. Huh? And a lot of uh, SME bosses were given help and you also got the rental rebates and all that. So you, you can see that uh, only the rich, I mean, I'm not saying only the rich, but most of the stocks are owned by rich people. They own real estate and, and stocks in general. They are only two things that they do. You can see that uh, uh, the people that take advantage of this uh, railing stock market is the rich and they are getting richer, a lot richer. You can see also the, in UK, the real estate prices record high, no? In COVID times, where some of the cities like uh, Nottingham still under lockdown and prices are up the highest, who are the people buying properties? It's usually the richest people who qualify for mortgage or pay all cash. So I, it is my concern that the wealth gap is getting uh, wider. And that's why I said that the only way or one of the ways, effective ways uh, is for people who kick-started their uh, career, I mean, just started, just graduated, to straight away invest in stocks. Learn as much as you can. I mean, in school, they don't teach you how to invest in stocks. I mean, even you're in finance, you know what is a DCF, IRR, all that, but you may not know what is the best way to buy. Okay? It's the best way is to get, to sign up for courses, pay for them. I mean, don't go for the free courses. I mean, if you want to go for free courses, usually... They may not give you everything or there's a catch to upsell you to another course, but they pay for courses, pay for something and learn from the best how to make money so they can hop on board. Um, I, I don't have a solution. I am concerned and the rich are getting richer. You know, when I first graduated, right, 2000, 2000 the, bub the tech bubble burst and then all three, the markets came down. I didn't have much savings then. My only regret was that I didn't take the courses that, that I should have. If I had learned stock investing, I think I would be closer to my financial freedom today than, than ever. So yeah, to cut the, I mean, to cut to the chase, the gap is indeed getting wider and uh, it is a concern. Okay, so, so where do this advantage, besides having more money, right, uh, or more capital to invest um, for these uh, wealthy people? Okay, so what other, but I guess they also didn't learn all this in school, right? So what gave them that skill set to grow their wealth even further? I think most of them made their money from their business. They made their money from business. Not, I have not come across someone that made their money from, from stocks. Because I think if you made your money from stocks, like a hedge fund manager or fund manager, you'll be putting money in your own fund you wouldn't be opening a private banking account. Let's be honest here. So most of the people that we met are the fund, uh, the, the business owners. Business owners. So they are really very good at their own business. For 10, 20 years, they built from nothing to 20, 30 million. Some clients I know even buy sell businesses, they start one from scratch and then paid up capital, 100,000 and then sell it for 10 mil, 20, 30 mil and then restart the whole another business and then sell it again. And in their 20 year career, like buy, sell four times. And then they are worth that much. So uh, they may not be very good at investing in stocks, actually, uh, because a lot of them may be very good in business and they think that it applies to stock. But actually, you all know that this rally in the last five months has got nothing to do with the economy, you know. I mean, the only thing I, I think they have the edge is being a business person, they can smell the other business owner that's a listed company, like example, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, is he of a, a good manager or is Tesla, uh, 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 you know, the CEO, is he a good Elon Musk, is he a good fund, uh, good CEO or not? But the timing to invest, they don't have the, they may not have the technical knowledge to know, okay, the IRR is such and then the NPV or oh, therefore I should invest. Look at the chart. They are so busy at their business, they got no time to look 
take all these courses. So whether it's resting on the moving average, it's time to buy or not, they, they don't. Lah. So I will say that actually, if you invest in stocks, it's a level playing field. If you really, if you are young, 25 years old, you take up a lot of courses, read a lot of books, or watch a lot of YouTube channels. I mean, there's a lot of advice out there as well, YouTube channels. You actually can pick up investing skills and you can achieve maybe 10, 20, 30 percent per year versus these guys who just started accumulating uh, after accumulating so much wealth just started investing in stocks and who may not attend any of this and then they they solely uh, rely on their bankers to help them and a lot of the bankers are they 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 will give you the bank's advice okay it may be giving you six to seven percent return so if you really want very good returns you may need to take up some courses to to up there so the, I, I don't think they really have an edge over it. I think they do have an edge in the private or direct investment part, private equity or direct. But when it's a single investor investment, for example, um, you have Grab or was it Uber or Impossible Foods opening up their investments as a, a share investment, which is very chunky. It's like $1 million per, per investment to, to a select group of investors. And you actually got the time to do due diligence, looking through the books, knowing whether this company is worth investing. Uh, they may have the edge, right? they understand that, that, that business, they happen to be in there, then they would, I think they will have the edge. Otherwise, it's a level playing field, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you're saying is that in the public markets, the high net worths do not have an advantage over anybody else, right? Whereas in the private market, because uh, first of all, they have access, due to uh, the level of wealth they have and also um, they are businessmen themselves and they have uh, so-called uh, uh, built up the experience to really access, assess a pri uh, private entity a lot better than uh, someone who has never built a business yeah. before. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, do, do all these uh, wealthy people, do they invest in this private equity or real estate more than the public markets or what, what is the typical allocation like? For their wealth okay the private banking clients generally make their money from uh from uh, their business so business may take up about 60 to 80 percent of it okay i think when they get older like i mean like 50 plus or whatever they think they think about stepping down i want to smell roses and all that okay then they, they say okay let, let me sell away some of my shares or sell away part of the business and then take all this cash and then what do I do with it? Okay, then I start to look at stocks. Because the stock return may not be as good as their own business. The R for their own business can be 100, 200% a year, right? So uh, so that's how it develops. So most of their wealth come from uh, their business. And I will say that um, uh, I have seen also clients that are property investors in the past especially in Singapore, I think the heydays of, correct, if there are any property agents, you may disagree with me, but the heydays of property investing was in the 80s, 90s, 2000, where you really can make a lot of money. Or, I mean, interest, deferred payment schemes, lining up for a new flat, eh? and you can make millions from this. I've seen before, uh, I can, you know, buy, sell houses. So uh, you could buy 20 houses in, in uh, five years, and then because in Singapore, economic growth rate was 10, 15 percent per year while the house prices are rising at 15, 20 percent. And then uh, the government doesn't intervene at that time so much. Right. So when you sell, there's no capital gains tax. So most of that business is still in most of the wealth is still 60, 70 percent in business. 20 percent in real estate is getting less, it's getting less and maybe 10 to 20 percent in stocks and bonds. That, that's how it works. That's Singapore clients. Uh, for uh, Western clients, I detect more PE type of business. Personal business may be only about 50%, more stock holding. I think my theory is that uh, for, for more advanced countries, uh, more developed countries, a lot more wealth is into stocks than mm. business. They know how to encash it at a much earlier age and then enjoy life. Uh, 
which is what all we want, right? We don't work until we're 80, then, wow, I got a stroke. Oh, no. What do I do? I can't even enjoy. So they know in the Western world, I think maybe in a way they got it right. Eh? They got it right. They know how to slow down when they are 45. I mean, I really envy them. Buy a yacht and then start to get a private jet and then enjoy life a bit and then hold some stocks, liquid investments. I think I think they, they started much earlier. So that, that is the profile of it. Yeah. Could, it, could it could it also be that you know in the west the m a activities is a lot more uh frequent compared to the east yeah, yeah because yes. because it seems like the west uh, likes to grow by true acquisition so m a activity tends to be a lot more and people has a lot more chances to encash their businesses yeah yes. that's just my guess i have no empirical evidence <laughs> yeah then i think that's true i think that's true also they they believe in this family values in Asian society is a lot stronger. So you, you start your business, you definitely want your son, eldest son. Pass it down. Uh. And then if he doesn't have the attitude because, hey, I just like to draw and paint or be a musician or actor. And then you keep hammering a, a square peg in the round hole. Uh, in the West, they really know how to hire a professional manager to, to run their business. So that allows you to distance yourself and he could run it with a lot more energy than you, you know, when you hit a mm. certain age. I think in that aspect, I admire them because there's greater com continuity, la, the business. Otherwise, you hand over to children that probably don't wish to take over and hit it and and then they do a bad job of it and the whole, whole business goes down. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions that our listeners have... Uh kid in sure. so eric is asking how can we mitigate the 15 percent absd to invest in more properties or property investment is over as for now do you think investing in property stock like hong kong land with stable is a better alternative than real estate yeah actually i think you answered a little bit of that just now so now now he, he brings it yeah. even closer right so if let's say uh, he's deciding between investing in property directly or buying property stocks <laughs> there's no legal way for you to escape ABSD except if you have a child and then you uh, hopefully your child you know set up a trust and then buy full cash for an apartment which will cost one to two mil and if you can afford that please come and find me I can open a private bank account it's almost impossible to, to do the escape the ABSD in Singapore I mean you can ask any lawyer uh, if you have call me also uh, PM me I want to know. I think a lot of people, uh, the wealthy has gone towards uh, uh, commercial uh, buildings, uh, commercial uh, real estate, logistics, uh, industrial. You can still get about 5 6% yield in that area, but you really got to be careful. I'm not an expert and I have not owned a, a commercial unit yet. I almost did uh, about eight years ago. Thank goodness I didn't, man. That, that was a retail shop. I, I, I gave a check and took it back. <laughs> if it had been today, I think it's rented out to. I walked past that so many times just to congratulate myself. I think the, the <laughs> tenant just turned over so many times. I mean, from a phone accessory shop that keep changes, changing a few times, and then right now the, the place is shuttered really. I mean, there's no tenant. So I think this is one of the things I, I, I'm not an expert to. to, to, to I, I, I think real estate now would changes so fast with covid we used to think office is rock solid investment and right now some of the clients are talking about uh 20 percent letting go of 20 percent of their space because they say hey work from home is so much more efficient and we save on real estate some banks are even saying hot desk so i'm not allowed to have personal items on my table now i don't know where my hot desk is if i need a table i have to press an app to book a table eh? so uh, i think the next part is office real estate demand will drop up and then you want to talk about retail i think no need really right just walk around only i think the the retail side in the outskirts is uh doing well neighborhood areas but orchard is gone i mean tough it's tough right so uh industrial i have no idea how is it going to pan out what is the next wave whether it's COVID or the attack of the robots that will change everything, I have no idea. It changes so fast. I think residential demand will still be there. We are humans, right? But you don't know what government policy is going to be. 
whether there will be more foreigners coming in uh, with this election issues and all that. It may change. Demand may change. Okay. So I guess most of you get answer. All right. Uh, I recall that you, you do invest in overseas properties, right? If I don't recall wrong. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, maybe you can share a bit more like in what countries or in which countries do you, do you see more opportunities for real estate? Okay. Without well, giving your secret sauce away. <laughs> <laughs> um, I invest in UK real estate because of uh, Singapore that they have uh, uh, well I mean I'm very blessed to have one uh, on block and that in Singapore that got me started with, with investing further and and again back to my story uh, it was because of my corporate banking years of very hard work analyzing real estate helping the developers I understood how to do a uh, on block without uh, with a IRR spreadsheet without studying architecture. So uh, maybe one day I should retirement job, start teaching and how to find a but is Anyway, so from there I went to UK. Why UK? I'm an Arsenal fan. And in 07, they shifted stadium to from Highbury to, to another place. I can't remember Emirates. Whatever. So the old stadium was dismantled and then became, uh, they built flats. And then when I went there, I mean, I, I was supposed to watch a game. I know Elvin is Liverpool fan, right? So No, no, menu, menu. Menu, okay. I've been there many times. <laughs> old Trafford. So when you when you, when I went to um, uh, Highbury, I realised how cheap the apartments are. And, and London's standard of living is quite similar to Singapore. Okay. So the flats were like £250,000 for one two bedroom. At that time, it was very cheap. It got, got me thinking. And the rental yield it was six to seven percent, no? and borrowing cost was four. It's amazing. So, so you need to invest in cities. Uh, I'm not advocating you must go to UK. Some people love Tokyo. Some of the cities where the rental yield on the net. I'm not talking about gross and uh, gross and net because the service charges can be ridiculous. So the net yield could be six. The borrowing cost could be three and the more you borrow the the more cash flow you get and that is what you want uh that's why for one reason i i i don't really invest in singapore anymore you 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 buy with a rental year of three net of everything become two then your borrowing cost is two the worst thing is the more you buy the poorer you are then you're stuck in your job for another 10 years so i i know of relatives that do that they boast of buying wow river gate huh? then the mortgage is like 1.5 million valuation of the house came down every month had to pay 5k in in mortgage payments and then the rental is only 4k wow i tell you you'll be very stressed so go for positive go for arbitrage there are there are not many cities left in in the world go and look for those yeah and and watching football following your favorite football club will help that's that's <laughs> right, man. So I, I really have to thank Arsenal for, for helping me. I mean, that's why I stay a fan regardless of their bad performance in the last 10 years. I have this. Oh, and also the Arsenal, buying Arsenal share at that time was £8,000 per share when Arsene Wenger was in charge. I think it was taken over at £38,000. Okay. Yeah. Uh, See? I don't own a lot. You follow the, you follow the, right, just you follow the right football club. <laughs> a stingy football club lah, that never wins trophies <laughs> okay yeah. um, let's move on to the next question Brian has this question what is the best way to invest 100k versus 1 million <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it's very contextual right it depends on right yeah. beyond the 100k what is your exposure what's your objective etc right yeah. maybe maybe he, he, I, i'm just guessing uh maybe he's asking right is there a difference between investing 100k versus investing one million dollars actually it's a good question uh. i mean it depends on your knowledge right what is your experience investing if you have taken a lot of courses and then you are you are very confident of what you're going to do then you for 100k you can already build a portfolio of stocks whether it's in us or hong kong or singapore for me 
60 to 70 percent of my portfolio is in the US. Okay, because I think I I com I I feed back to Elvin before how I love that you cover US stocks so that I can read your wonderful reports and then I know what to buy. Okay. Only 30%, uh, 30% of my portfolio is in uh, Hong Kong stocks and funds, and 10% is in Singapore because it doesn't move much. La. Only reads is the only thing that I look at. So um, if you your knowledge is good, uh, I know some people even with 100 k you can set up a portfolio of options. And for options, you could buy a long-dated option that is 2 to 3 years with delta of 0.5. And you can own uh, for a hundred thousand. You don't have to le- Please don't leverage on options. Go and learn on what options before you do. It could be weapons of mass destruction. But I mean, if you do it well, the core option can be on a few very good stocks. You need to select whatever it is options or 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 stocks. You need to know the company well, quality company. Don't go and buy option because oh, the chart looks good. The company must be solid, rock solid company, so they keep going up. Then your core options will be not expire worthless and then you learn how to do it. so hundred thousand you may need to uh if you really want to grow you may need to take some aggressive more slightly more aggressive uh depending on your your objective like positions uh, and options give you that <clears throat> you can buy unit trust if you don't really know all etfs you know when if you don't really know what to buy and you're not good at uh uh investment fundamental analysis uh, just to know, uh, ETF in general, yes, they, they are good. They are cheap vehicles. But those listed in US have got 30% withholding tax or dividends. So if it's listed in US, a lot of liquidity, but uh, got, got tax implication. Uh. So for, for funds, uh, choose a few good funds uh, that at least beat the ETF. And then because they are out of Luxembourg, uh, a lot of funds are in Luxembourg or or in Ireland, Dublin, or Singapore, there's no dividend tax. So that's one thing that you need to think about. Uh, if you have a million, wow, you have a lot of things to look at. You could diversify into uh, maybe a little bit of uh, some good hedge funds that can do long short. Of course, you need a, a private bank or high, a, a priority bank account to, to buy that. Even Fund Supermart has... Uh, if you are AI accredited investor, you can invest in some of the good hedge funds. Uh, the reason why you, you invest in good hedge funds is that when the market drops, sometimes they can go up. Okay, but you don't expect 30, 50% return a year. Lah. So uh, you can also buy some gold, silver, whether it's ETF. You can do that with 100,000, you can do that with a million. Of course, million, I think, is all psychology as well, right? You can, it's how you manage. Whether you manage a million or 100K, I will approach it almost the same way okay but of course psychologically with a million i will leverage a lot less i will be thinking of preservation more as well as growth and i will be hedging it because for me personally uh, i mean a 30 percent correction if you have i have a million dollars is three hundred thousand down you can you it really can affect you uh you you, you know it, it, i'm learning not to let it affect me now but I think it, you know, I still need to hedge. With if I had a hundred thousand, I think thirty thousand down, okay. I mean, to me, you know, two, three years time I'll be out of it. So so I think generally as you get wealthier and wealthier, you tend to be happy with less return, more diversified, and then uh do a bit more hedging, like you don't lose that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, basically, what you're saying is that uh, if you approach it uh, proportionally, it's not how much, uh, you have, but of course, there's uh, some differences, lah, Right. Uh, one million, yeah. you can buy hedge fund, right, and maybe you go into more preservation to protect the capital that you build up. Okay. Yeah. So I hope, uh, Brian, get answer. All right. Uh, policy work asked about commercial property. I think, uh, Jeff has covered it, right? Yeah. Okay. Gary asked a very yeah. interesting question. So many costs out there. How do we tell it is real thing and not some bogus upselling guru? <laughs> <laughs> I like your question. You're very frank. <laughs> Gary, yeah. Very frank. Okay. When you pay for costs uh, and you want a mentor, okay, mentor, or you even meet a financial advisor in a bank or wherever, ask for their track record and i respect 
people who show their trading record or their investment record. Okay, if you can show that the person is consistently, doesn't matter if you're doing 5 to 8% per year, I respect that. And I want to know your style. What, when is it that you perform well? So look for a trading record. Ask for it. I, I'm not going to endorse anybody online because whoever I endorse, the rest that I didn't endorse is going to kill me, okay? Go out there and do your homework. There are a few gurus out there that are financially free. Uh, they do show their track record. If they don't show, very hard. Lah. You have to write down what they say. Today they say buy what, what uh, carnival and then you have to write down this date at what price and then three years later then you decide whether he's worth paying i mean yeah okay so yeah please don't endorse anybody right <laughs> uh, except dr okay. well, i think no 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 cannot say, cannot say that. Cannot say well. that. no 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 cannot say that okay so let's move on to the next one. no promotion of <laughs> any you. company yes okay um Okay, Dershin was saying that uh, when we talk about allocation, so she, he's saying that Tiger 21, right? Uh, private equity is about 25%, public equity 25%, property 30%, bonds 10%, hedge fund 5%. Yeah, so that's the typical uh, wealth for the Tiger 21 guys, okay? Tiger uh, 21, sorry, don't know what's that. <laughs> I, I think it's a US uh, uh, high net worth, I think some club, right? All right. Okay. okay uh let's move on uh oh eric follow-up question i think it's referring to currency uh currency risk okay because uh, when we talk about overseas investing right then more of it is uh, currency depreciation yeah. right like whether is it in uk or whether it's in us uh sing dollar has been strong against many many currency uh if it's against developing countries even they perform even worse right so developed countries is not a bad but we still see quite a big chunk of that uh, currency power being eroded so uh, do you have any like advice should you hatch or suck it up oh uh, yeah no <laughs> okay so my personal take is always uh when you are buying overseas right always take a mortgage in that country uh, if you can okay number one if you are in an emerging country no can no cities mentioned uh, the the you want to know that the title is good uh, so the lawyer may not even be you know a lot of things can be fake in, in a third world country so if you pass get a mortgage and it's mortgageable by the bank the bank put the money down and lend you you are is probably the title is probably true okay Otherwise, in some country, I know they can even sell the property three times for the same unit. And then when you get the key, well, so try to borrow in their currency. So if you are buying an Australian real estate, I don't recommend that at all. Uh, borrow in Aussie so that your pro your asset is in Aussie, your, your mortgage is in Aussie. And that's why it's very important to be positive cash flow. Not pound against sing dollar loan. Uh, it's pound against pound loan. It must be positive. If it's not positive, you need to ask yourself, why are you investing? Yeah, so so that is the best currency hedge. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that uh, borrow in the currency that you're investing in, and of course, yeah. the rental you'll be collecting in the same currency, right? And yeah. if it's positive, you'll be able to pay it off without any currency risk that's, that's there. Okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, Chunip asks, how do you hedge? Is that for equities? I think you are referring to the hedge funds, right? Do you mainly use hedge fund to hedge or do you have other ways to hedge against uh, equities? Yeah. Right? Because you mentioned about correction can be like 30%. Hedge against equity. Yeah, yeah. Equity uh, corrections. You mentioned about going down 30%, right? So oh, hedge. You yeah. can buy put spreads, right? You buy at the money put or slightly out of the money put and then you sell one or two puts to defray the cost. In the end, you hedge one, 1 million worth of stocks. You could only pay 6% for six months worth of uh, put spread, right? So it, five to six uh, depends on how out the money. And if you believe that the stock market is going to correct not more than 20%, you can sell puts at 20% level. And then you, like this correction, uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, maybe quite a mild one because a lot of people are holding cash. So you don't need to do a put spread for for very deep uh, uh, discounts. 
So it might be one way to do it. Some people do inverse ETF. You have to be very careful. Uh, don't do the three times inverse if you are not uh, skilled in it uh, because you can lose a lot of money. Uh, the best way to hedge is keep more cash. Uh. But if you are a long-term investor, you shouldn't be buying, selling, buying, selling your shares just to predict a, a, a correction. Yeah. Because, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Elvin, I mean, a, a stock market is in bull run 80% of the time, you know, I mean, in, in US. I mean, you've got a higher chance of uh, making money in the S&P 500 when it's bull run 80% that, that you got, then your marriage is to be successful, right? You got a greater chance of divorce, which is 50% chance. So you're just hedging that 20% down, that, 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 that 20% of the time that is in bear market. So don't, don't be too fixated. Like if you're a long-term investor, just let the volatility roll. And if you cannot sleep, then maybe you need to invest less, uh, then keep more cash. Hmm. Yeah. How, how do most of the clients hedge? Or do they even hedge? against stock market correction? Mm, they can buy put spreads. They generally uh, hold more cash. If they are leveraged, then usually, uh, okay, I will tell my clients, I, I honestly am very proud of it. I hardly have clients at margin calls. So what I do is I tell them, this is your buffer. You can withstand a 20% drop or 25% before you get margin call. And this is, something that I study time and again. And I will tell them that if you if you are worried about a crash or you want to hold, you want to have buffer to buy, ammunition to buy uh, when the stocks are down 20, uh, I think you need to keep a wide buffer. Uh. So so this is what I will do to hedge. I, I think, don't promise that, you know, stock market volatility is here. Uh, you must be able to sleep away. Okay. Yeah. Related question, Lushing is asking, what's the average leverage for a typical private banking account in Singapore? Do you have this number? It varies from client to client, advisor to advisor. Client to client, uh, some people just want to leverage the max. Okay. It can be three, four times. It depends on the products. It could be government bonds, HDB bonds. You could leverage about six, seven times, although it doesn't make sense now. The yield of a HEB bond is only 2%, right? Borrowing cost might be slightly higher. We could leverage. Borrowing cost might be about 1.5% now, or 1.6. And then just for that uh, 50 bits carry, you know, you leverage about five, six times. I think it's not worth, uh, okay, for bonds. But uh, yeah, maybe it depends. Uh, some people don't, okay. a lot of wealthy clients don't even want to maybe. leverage. Okay. And you have $50 million is enough. Eh? Just put in the bank a fixed deposit already give you how much do you really need to leverage so i think the richer they are generally don't they leverage less okay and the more you uh, leverage the more active you have to be huh? you cannot yeah. let it lying here because huh? it can go to zero <laughs> <laughs> three times leverage a 10 percent correction uh, means that you're down 30 imagine a 30 percent correction you wipe out man you cannot force that's, that's, why, that's why they pay you to monitor for them <laughs> Wow, a lot of high attack, man. Yeah, so when the market is up, you actively, your trading costs will go up one, no, when you leverage because you, you cannot keep three times leverage whether bull or bear, no. I mean, market at the bottom, you can leverage slightly more. Right at the top, you better be cutting your leverage down to one and a half or one time if you have, oh, there's an element of timing for leverage. Okay, okay. So uh, the second part of the question is hedging USD. Yeah, I, I think probably he's referring more to the equities, not so much of properties, right? Because property you can borrow against the, the currency they're yeah. investing in. Uh, whereas for equity, let's say you buy a lot of US stocks. Uh, is mm. there a need to hedge? I think, Alvin, you know, right? I mean, you, you don't need to. Personally, I don't think you need to hedge. Lah. US dollars, currency drop, the company can export more stuff. So under, unless it's hyperinflation. But if you want to... If you really want to hedge, we have forwards, currency forwards for one year, or you can do that. You can sell US dollar and, and again, sing uh, in private banking, you can do that. But uh, the, the cost of hedging is, is, the, is the interest rate differential. Uh, and it can be it used to be very costly when US interest rate is high. But uh, generally, I, I, I don't suggest, unless you buy bonds, uh, you need you you probably need to look at hedging because it's a fixed return, man. You lend 
500k, you come back 500k. If you buy a, a Turkish bond, that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, last question. Gabriel is asking, does priority banking like DBS Treasure, okay, we don't know <laughs> whether they have, but in general, priority banking, do they have such wealth products, hedging, etc.? Probably referring to will the, will the uh, RM help with all these put options if they are I in priority don't... banking? Okay. For currency forwards, uh, as I, I'm not familiar, that familiar with DBS, whether they have, I, I, at priority level, I think generally hedging instruments are very, very, very uh, limited, uh, very limited. Uh, I think it will be quite difficult to do any kind of hedging for bonds. Uh, forwards, all this will be not available to most priority banking site, although they allow you to do uh, leverage. That means some clients with real estate, if you talk about loans, then they even borrow some of it from their, their portfolio. And because in priority bank, they do, some banks allow you to borrow in different currencies. And if you have a UK or Australian property, you could borrow some cash out in that currency, like pound and Australia, and then go and put in for the equity portion. And the rest of it, you borrow against the banks there. I mean, it's it's getting very hard in Australia to borrow anything anyway. So mm. so you could borrow against your portfolio. It could help you hedge in real estate, but not uh yeah, very few it's instruments. Also a bit difficult, uh. mm, at priority okay. level. All right. Uh thank you very much. Yeah. That's the last question we'll we have. Okay. Actually I still have more questions, but I think uh it's time to call it a day. Uh, Holiday, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's past the hour. Yeah, yeah, actually, the longest uh guest that we have already, right? So, oh, really, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think usually, our, we... our chemistry of uh, interviewer <laughs> and interviewee quite good, uh, we talk yeah, well, yeah. So, Cause, yeah. Cause we often talk out together, so <laughs> that's why very often, yep, yep, yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for sharing Thanks. a lot of our stories, and I think uh, a lot of them are very interested, and probably they get their answers from you, right? Uh, so, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Elvin. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. Cheers. Good night, everyone. Thank you.